Uh, my name is Kevin Callahan. I'm a member of the 8th Air Force Historical Society of Minnesota. I'm here today with uh, Clinton Johnson for an oral history project interview and uh, we're going to talk about his uh, experiences during World War II. Um, let me start with, uh, what's your full name? Clinton Benedict Johnson. And when were you born? February 25th, 1921. And so how old does that make you today? I'm 90 plus a couple of months. Okay, uh, where were you born? Minneapolis. And did you grow up in Minneapolis? And grew up in Minneapolis. Okay. Um, what were your parents' names and can you tell me a little bit about uh, their background? Okay. My dad was Walter Christ Johnson, come from the Waconia, Minnesota area. His father was Carver County Sheriff, died uh, at the end of one term when my dad was 11 years old. He went back to Waconia from Chaska and lived with his sister and her husband. My mother, Matilda Barbara Johnson, was born in Waverly, Minnesota, of a farm family, and met my dad in Waconia. They were married in 1919 and moved to Minneapolis. Uh, did you have uh, siblings? I had one sister, Rosella, who passed away about 13 years ago. She was married to Garrett Burns out of Watertown, Minnesota, and lived her life after marriage there. Mm -hmm. um, so you grew up in the Minneapolis area. Where did you go to school? I went to grade school, Rosedale Grade School, 43rd and Wentworth. Wentworth. It's no longer in existence. Junior High, Ramsey, Junior High, 50th and Nicollet, and Washburn High, 50th and Wentworth. Graduated from there in January of 1939. And they had uh, January and June graduations back At then? At that time, yes. Uh, so when you graduated, did you have any jobs or anything after uh, getting out of high school? I was working part-time at a truck line, United Shipping, where my dad had two trucks on lease. And when I graduated, the next Monday I started full-time at that same, on the same company, same job. Mm -hmm. uh, so you graduated in 39 and then Pearl Harbor happened in 41 in December. Um, do you have recollections of or impressions from the time before we got involved in in the Pearl Harbor attack? Well, I was working. I remember the morning that they announced Pearl Harbor. We were in our car going from home down to Incarnation Church on that Sunday morning when the bombing of Pearl Harbor was was announced. And of course the requirement for registering for the draft was was in effect. I believe it was in effect already at that at that time. And what were people's attitudes when they heard about Pearl Harbor? Do you remember the, their first impression? Well, I uh, don't recall too much of that. You were registered for the draft and you figured you were going to become part of it because the war in Europe was had been going on for a number of years and uh, now we had the war in the Pacific with the Japanese and uh, at that time you didn't know of any way that you were 
not going to be involved. So were you uh, uh, enlisting or did you get drafted or how did you end up being inducted? I decided that I didn't like to walk as a soldier and I couldn't swim for as a sailor so I decided I would enlist in the Air Force. I had to do quite a bit of exercising. I was a too heavy for the Air Force requirements, but I got my weight down, went to Fort Snelling in September of 1942 to the Armory Building and enlisted. Do you remember what the weight limits were for getting into the Army Air Corps? At that time it was 188 pounds mm -hmm. and uh, I was over that. I used to go to to Nicollet Field and 40th and Nicollet. Every evening there would be a group of, of guys who play touch football or anything to do, do some exercising over and above your normal movement. So what did they do when you were inducted? Um, were you given tests or how did you end up actually getting into the, the Army Air Corps? Well, we were enlisted there, and uh, medical uh, medical history. There was a a check there, and then were sent home and said we would be notified. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the late winter of '43 that I had my call to active duty actually in March of 1943. Mm -hmm. We had to report to the old federal building on Washington and 3rd Avenue and that morning they marched us across 3rd Avenue to a troop train ready to go in the Milwaukee Railroad Station. That's still uh, still around. They've uh, restored that building. I think the old Milwaukee Road building is a hotel now. It's a hotel and I think some kind of a skating rink. Mm -hmm. But the uh, outer structure is still there. Uh, I use the term troop train. They had the curtains down. The uh, Cadets from northern Minnesota and North Dakota didn't make it in because they were snowed in and we headed south, stopped in Des Moines in Kansas City and it was after we were well beyond Kansas City that they come with pencil and paper and said, when you're headed for San Antonio, Texas, you can write home and tell them where you're going. <laughs> What was the troop train like? Was it uh, a newer one or an old World War I vintage? Or? Well, it was uh, not too bad. It had sleepers on it and uh, uh, three other cadets that I had met at Fort Snelling were also called at the same time and were on the train so we were not with strangers. and. Made it to San Antonio. So and you uh, you did your basic training at San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center. That was uh, yes, it was your actually your original basics. Yes, there you got your uniforms, your medical exams, and that we were there. I think eleven weeks. At that time. We were given the choice of what we wanted to be involved in. Most wanted pilot training. I was different. I asked for navigation training. And why, why did you ask for navigation training? I guess it goes back to some of them. I used to enjoy uh, 
mathematics and uh, geometry and that stuff in high school. Uh, I'd never been on an airplane. I didn't have that urge that maybe other ones did. So my request was for navigation. And uh, what was your prior experience before going into the Army Air Corps with, uh, with airplanes? You, hadn't, you had never to, ridden on one I'd before? I've never been on a, on a plane. I guess my only experience was driving out to the airport and, at, uh, in Minneapolis and sit up on the hill and watch the airplanes take off and land when we were younger. So that would have been in the 30s you That's were correct, doing that? yes. Uh -huh. And what kind of airplanes did they have? Like C-47s then? No, that was before. I think, I think you have to go back to the Ford Trimotors and that. Uh, and the 47s were probably the newer planes that were just coming in. Some Lockheeds. And what do you remember of uh, basic training in San Antonio? What did they do uh, when you were in basic? Well, you learned, uh, <laughs> you learned how to march, get into shape. The first four or five weeks, you, you didn't even get off the base. And then you had to leave to go to town. And I remember downtown San Antonio, which now has the river walk and many. Uh, Hotels and restaurants and that at that time it was it was a park down there, but really not not anything uh, near what it is today. Was there a lot of uh, people there that were in uniform and and training then? You mean in San Antonio? Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, there were several bases right there around San Antonio, and uh, when you completed there, then you you got transferred to your next next training station. So, did you have to take a, an aviation exam of some sort in order to get into the the navigation program? You know, I don't recall. Anything that uh, that I had to uh, had to sweat out there. Uh. <laughs> so the next step following basic would be what? Um, did you have some kind of classification or pre-flight school? Well, you, you we were sent to Ellington Field at Houston, Texas, which was a ground school as far as navigation was concerned. And uh, we were there until around September of 43, when we were transferred to San Marcos, Texas, which was advanced navigation. And there we started to fly in Beechcraft AT-7, which had a pilot, the instructor in navigation, and three cadets in their training. Was that the first time you'd been in an airplane then? The first time I was in an airplane was at San Marcos, and it was rather... Uh, Enlightening flight. We did instrument calibration at about 200 feet over a, some country land, very flat, but it was very different. I got sick once during that. Uh, those tests. Sick? You mean like an air sick? Air sick, and. Uh, if you messed up the plane, you cleaned it up, or <laughs> you paid a ground, a ground crew member in the uh, 
at the base to clean up. Did you clean it up yourself then? Or pay for no, it? No, I think I probably paid somebody <laughs> that you were in no, <laughs> no shape to, uh, to do that, do it right. So, uh, in terms of navigation, <clears throat> um, did they teach you like doing it with dead reckoning or with maps or uh, sextants or how, how, how did you, instruments? The, the three students when you were in a beach and flying, the uh, number one student would be giving uh, routes and uh, times to the pilot. The second student followed. He used the instruments and made record of where he thought we were going or had been. And the third one was allowed to look outside and do dead reckoning mm -hmm. with a map uh, to check on highways, mm -hmm. railroads, lakes, and so forth. And then you'd get your turn, you'd rotate around. Now I've heard the term pilotage, is that the where you look out the window and try and identify the objects on the ground right. and where you are? Right, I guess that would be, be the word that you could use. And um, let's see, did you get any time off the base in San Marcos or...? San Marcos, yes. We, uh, Our normal routine would be, we'd, as soon as the uh, Saturday evening, there was a funeral home in San Marcos that had a, a limousine. And he'd rent the limousine for a ride into town, take us to a steak shop where we'd have a nice meal, and then and that that actually was, they took us to New Braunfels, which was the next town south of San Marcos. And being an old German town, after your meal and so forth, you went to the town hall, where there was always a German band and some dancing. And everybody from the youngest girl to the oldest grandma was there. And then the limousine would come back and pick you up at 12 or 1 o'clock, whatever you'd set, take you back to the base. Sunday afternoon, most often we would go to the golf course in the afternoon. And for, the, I believe we paid $3.00. We'd get a, a bag, three, four golf clubs, three golf balls, and a dry t-shirt, you know, so you could, didn't have to sweat up in your <laughs> t-shirt that you had, didn't you? You had to be back to the base for, for um, the flag to come down. That was your routine. Probably all the money you had. Was it kind of hot in uh, those towns? It was, it was warm there, yes. Uh, you had, during the week, you, you'd had your classes and you uh, practiced with your sextant, your camera to shoot the stars and the, the uh, sun and so forth. And try to... Uh, Try to improve your your navigation skills, and then you usually well, you had one flight for um, which was probably the longest one we had to El Paso, Texas. From there, I happened to be lead navigator on the trip that I remember, and. Uh, Instructor asked 
Is that your last correction? Last? You give them a compass heading, a time of arrival, and uh, he said, well, stick your head up here. We got the curtain up in front. And of course, your heart sinks. You figure you're lost. But uh, I was fortunate. I come right down over the center of El Paso. I did miss it by 30 seconds, the estimate time of arrival, which was a good feeling. At least that mission was good. Well, eventually you, you were given or awarded a commission as a navigator and you uh, got your silver wings from the advanced school, or was that at another location? No, that was there. And on December the 3rd of 1943, we graduated from our advanced training there at San Marcos and uh, expected we had our commission as a second lieutenant and our wings as a navigator. We were all packed. I had transportation back to Minneapolis expecting to to have a 10-day leave. I opened my orders. It said report to Roswell, New Mexico for bombardier training on Monday morning. I had to leave my friend Norm Grant, who was heading back to Minneapolis. He was going to get married. I was going to be in his wedding party. We parted company. Of course, his career changed. He ended up in Europe. And I ended up in Bombardier School. So you didn't have enough time to attend the wedding as the best man? No, not, mm -hmm. not at that time, no. So as soon as you got the orders, you had to hop on the train? There was a train that went across western Texas. They had it, uh, they knew what they were doing. There was 43 of us out of about 350 that graduated on that December 3rd uh, ceremony that ended up in the Bombardier School. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause for just a moment here. Okay, so um, you're on a, a troop train, I'm assuming, heading south? That was, uh, no, that was just a, a regular commercial train, a passenger train. We uh, picked it up in, uh, in uh, San Marcos, and we had one transfer out in the middle of nowhere, just an intersection of two railroads. It got us into Roswell, and we uh, assumed our our next class. Mm -hmm. And then uh, was Roswell set up sort of the same, where you had kind of a uh, beginning school, and then there was an advanced part of bombardier training, or was it no, all done it, there? Uh, it all uh, it really really wasn't any any advanced. Deal. You, uh, first you started to work with the uh, with the bomb site, the Norden site, and so forth. And of course, there was classes, and you started to fly in a beach B11, which was similar to the navigation plane, only with a chopped off nose, where the bombardier sat up in the front with the site. Roswell was also a four-engine bomber transition place where pilots learned how to fly a four-engine plane. Mm -hmm. There was. How long was uh, bombardier school, and and how long was it uh, compared to navigation school? About three and a half months. It was. Uh, it was. Maybe a little shorter than navigation, if you put all the uh, the ground schools, the two ground schools that have navigation together. We graduated. There you already had your commission. You earned your wings as a bombardier, and uh, then we were 
we were sent home on a leave. We only had, had our leave then. Uh, what did you uh, think of the Norton bomb site? It was uh, an instrument that. Uh, of course, I had never seen anything like that. It was uh, really not too complicated. You. Uh, changed, uh, there was adjustments on it to change the, uh, the speed you coordinated, coordinated the position of the site to the ground speed it was probably the, uh, that's the secret of it, I mean, to uh, So at that time you actually had control of the airplane. You're you're flying the, the piloting. Bomb, the bombardier handling the bomb site actually flew the airplane. That was on autopilot at that time, connected right to the site. And if you uh, you turn the site um, to the left or to the right, you could you could make the airplane. Move to the left or right. And uh, by that time, did you know you were going to go into B 29s? Or when did you discover you were you're going to be flying on a B 29? No, I, I think at that time, and we were not, it wasn't too much about the B 29 that was out yet at that time. Um, the uh, the navigator bombardier, I think, was was used on some of the uh, twin-engine bombers, and on on occasion. But after our leave there, we were sent to Clovis, New Mexico for crew assignments. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain what crew assignment means? There you were assigned in a crew and you found out who your pilot, co-pilot, your navigator, bombardier, engineer, and your, your gunners, the your radar operator, radio operator, the eleven man crew on the B twenty nine, they were they were assigned. Mm -hmm. Now the bombardier and the navigator, we had gone through both schools and I smile sometimes because it really went one two, one two, bombardier, navigator, bombardier, right down the line. So you lined up and they just counted you off and you were either a navigator or a bombardier based that's, on that? <clears throat> so we had ended up, yes, a uh, good friend of mine ended up as a navigator and he wanted to be a bombardier. He finally got himself transferred but it took quite a bit of, of uh, work, arguing. At that time, uh, how did they uh, <clears throat> handle? Now, you you are one of the few people I've ever met who had basically earned two wings, right? Uh, you had both wings. Did they give you a, a combined wing for for the MOS of being navigator bombardier? Or did you wear two yeah, wing? Wore wings? two wings. So on your dress uniform, you wore two two wings. On. You could, yes. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and you didn't get two commissions, I assume. No. <clears throat> okay, so we're at Clovis, and you're assigned to your crew. Who was on the crew, and did you stay with the same people throughout your your time in the service? I did, uh, yes. We had one change, one gunner changed uh, 
But other than that, uh, our same pilot, bombardier, pilot, co-pilot, and engineer was all the same crew that, that was assigned there. We were sent from Clovis to, to Kansas. There were four bases in Kansas that were for the training of B-29 crews and we had the 73rd wing with four bomb groups in it and one each bomb group went to a to a separate base. I happened to be in the 498th bomb group. We ended up in Great Bend, Kansas. Was that uh, the that was a base? And did you pick up a, a airplane there, or? Well, they had uh, had some uh, training planes there, some B-17s and uh, a few B-29s. They were they were filtered in at that time. We had uh, twenty trained crews in the squadron in the. The group, but we only had 10 airplanes assigned. So it was not a, uh, a plane for every for every uh, crew. Do you have any idea why they would, they would have uh, two times the crew as the, the amount of the airplanes? I don't know. That uh, has always been a question. Uh, I think it was the lack of airplanes, mostly, or it could have been the length of the flights that they had planned for these crews, that there would be rest periods in between. Mm -hmm. That's two theories that uh, I've heard and I've thought about. Well, in addition to navigation training, bombardier training, did they give you any kind of um, training with gunnery where you'd uh, know how to operate the, the guns? Yeah, we had, uh, we had gunnery training. Um, the, uh, the bombardier, CFC gunner, and the two side gunners and tail gunner, of course, were the primary uh, gun operators. What does the CFC gunner mean? Central Fire Control. He uh, was in the rear compartment on a B-29 in a raised seat, swivel seat, with his head up through a blister at the top of the airplane. It was the, uh, I guess it would be the answer to the to the ball turret gunner on a B-17. <laughs> and on a pressurized airplane, you, you didn't have to actually have the wind blowing in your face and no, through a window. A, and <clears throat> that was a wonderful part about the B-29. You lived in pressure even at 30,000 feet. You didn't have to wear an oxygen mask. You're able to breathe in there, and a thousand times I see the picture of, of the gunners, the wind blowing in up through the open hatch in a 17 or a B-24. With the heavy uniform on, the warm uniform, and we didn't... Uh, we didn't have that. Which uh, which gun did you operate on the B-29? The bombardier had control of the upper front turret and the lower front turret. He could pass off the lower turret was always under the control of the bombardier. The upper turret could be passed to the CFC gunner. He could handle the uh, both upper turrets at one time. 
and uh, he always had control of the rear upper turret. The two side gunners controlled the rear lower turret. The tail gunner had his own. Did the front turrets, uh, were they able to turn 360 degrees or did they have a restricted uh, uh, field of fire? No, you were able to, uh, well of course you couldn't, you would only fire to the, to the front because your gun sight was uh, was unable to to uh, fire to the rear. Mm -hmm. I've never had that uh, question. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> no, that's that's true. That's when your uh, CFC gunner had. Uh, Where did the bombardier sit in the airplane? So right in the front, in the nose. You actually sat on the floor on a padded cushion that was on the floor and uh, right down in the front. Yeah. Did you have uh, radar operators by that point? Yes, <coughs> our radar operator <coughs> was in the rear compartment where his his controls were. So from Kansas, uh, where did you go from that point? When we left Kansas, <coughs> the 10 crews with the 10 airplanes flew to Marchfield in California, San Francisco, and we went by train. A lot of the ground crew also. And uh, from Marchfield, we were sent ATC, Air Transport Command, as they had room to Hawaii, on to Johnston Island, Kwajalein, Guam, and finally to Saipan. I, uh, we were in San Francisco quite a while. He had to report every morning at 9 o'clock and they would assign transportation to the number of uh, seats they had available. And you could uh, You could get passed up day by day. Finally our day came. My engineer and I spent five days in Hawaii. He had a, a relative there and visited with him. When we uh, <coughs> finally headed out west. My engineer was from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. and uh, What was his name? Bob Fleming. He uh, went to went to the University of Minnesota for his engineering degree. He was from Buffalo, New York, and his dad was the Mack truck distributor manager here. Was transferred here, and Bob completed uh, his high school in Buffalo. 1939 and then moved in back to Minneapolis with his parents and went to the university. As a result, he uh, met and knew a lot of my cl classmates from high school and he also lived in South Minneapolis on 50th and, and DuPont, not too far from here. So. Uh, but you met in the service. Met in the service when we were at Clovis, New Mexico, the crew assignment. Has he passed away? Bob? He, has, he has passed away. He, uh, when we come, got out of the service, he went to work for Honeywell, was transferred to New York City, and then went back to Buffalo and went to law school. 
and uh, he's been gone uh, quite a few years. He practiced law in New York? In Buffalo, yes. Mm -hmm. So you arrived in Saipan uh, at what uh, what time? About uh, the end of September of 1944. So it had been only liberated, I think it was in July, was yeah. when they first invaded, if I remember correctly. Was yeah. there, was it still, was it built up yet as a base? Well, it, they were pretty well along, yes. Uh, the, uh, the new airstrip, which had uh, two runways on, was was under construction. The Navy was in charge of the island, but uh, it was uh, it was getting along there. We uh, in, the, in November we did have some uh, some flights, uh, practice missions, I guess you'd call them. <coughs> With the first flight to Tokyo being dispatched in November um, on uh, November 24th, 1944. So that would be counted as your your first actual uh, mission for your, your count, but you had some training missions before? We had <coughs> two missions to Truk, which was a Japanese-held island that had been bypassed, mm -hmm. and one to Iwo Jima. The, uh, and then the first uh, first mission to Tokyo was November 24th. My first mission was November 27th, the, the second raid. Mm -hmm. um, during the time you were uh, doing the missions that were training missions, um, did they shoot at you or anything? I don't, uh, Kevin, I don't recall anything. Well, being Iwo Jima, I guess yeah. that's why I asked. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know. We hadn't taken Iwo Jima yet. No, no. We were, uh, we were under attack from Iwo Jima by twin-engine Bettys, uh, fighter bombers. We lost some planes on the ground at, uh, at Saipan. Were you there when, during that attack? Right. There were several, uh, several attacks. Uh, when, when a Japanese attack happened, did you have like a shelter you went to or what did you do? At first we didn't. We, we learned to fill sandbags in a hurry and built, uh, built a sandbag barrier right next to our, our Quonset huts, though it was not too far to the uh, to the seashore up against away from some away some little hills that you could you could hide behind but uh, I think it was only after about the first raid that we in a hurry had a had some shelters built. I understand too that Saipan wasn't absolutely secured in terms of the Japanese defenders that there were still people coming out of the, the hills, basically, for quite a bit of time afterward. Yes, okay, they were hiding in the caves. There were some caves. The island was about 300 feet high. There was some, uh, the runway was on 300 feet above the water. But um, I didn't, didn't see him, but I know that in one of our our lunch lines. The guy turned around and looked, and here was a, here was a Japanese soldier. He was hungry. He come down out of the hills and got in the chow line. And of course, they. He didn't go much further. <laughs> Did they? They escort him to the jail or something? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Did he get through the chow line first? Or? Well, I imagine he. No, I don't know whether he got. <laughs> got food there, but I'm sure that he got food elsewhere. Well, you had uh, you had to complete 30 missions, and then if a mission turned around or was aborted, that didn't count towards the 30. Is that the That's way it was correct. structured? Yes. And yeah. um, 
uh, most of your missions I assume were to Japan and um, uh, some of those were night missions um, and then you you had a something called a weather strike mission right and what, what could you explain what a weather strike uh, mission is when we first uh, started flying we had some weathermen that would fly with us and report back a weather conditions which they were trying to become the first Doppler radar but they were canceling because of weather missions that and then they started to send a, a plane, not every day. Some days they sent a plane every eight hours as they were planning another raid. And we would fly over Japan, north into the Japanese Sea, turn west, go a couple hundred miles north, west, and then head back south, always recording, recording cloud cover, winds, whatever weather conditions we were able to uh, put together, and fly back to Guam where the weather uh, people were were stationed and be debriefed there, and from that they would either let a mission go or maybe cancel it until the weather changed. I was on one weather mission on February 27th of 1945. We had the squadron navigator with us and on the weather missions Somebody started, you carried three bombs and you just pick some unfortunate little town that had no defense and drop three bombs for, should we say, fun. And uh, we did our mission and turned left and west and turn south and did our navigation and things with the sextant, checking the sun, position and so forth, and flew south and uh, there was rechecks on the sun. And our navigator, who was a good navigator, the squadron navigator, who was supposed to be as good or better than the rest, we flew six hours. We should have been in contact with, with Guam, hearing things. We finally realized we were lost and we broke radio silence and put out a mayday call and now this was eight days after the invasion of Iwo Jima by the Marines and there was a Navy convoy headed for Iwo Jima that answered our, picked up our message, sent a couple fighters up through the overcast to check us out and uh, then that gave us a, talked to us and gave us a heading to Guam. We turned left, which would give us an eastern heading. And after we arrived at Guam, 
we were able to determine that we were 476 miles west of Guam, still heading south when we put out the call for help. So you were indebted to the Navy on that, that one, to that, that mission? Yes, uh, to the Navy, yes. Two days later, we were still in doing our own investigation, trying to figure out what had happened. <coughs> and Navis, Celestial Navigation, you were given a book of charts which gave you a correction for the movement of the sun over the or sun or the moon or stars in the universe and you better use the right date our navigator opened the book to the wrong date as a result he had done a correction and we were from the time we used the new heading we were headed in the wrong direction all turned out good and <laughs> made it made it back made it home well it must have been pretty scary to be over the pacific ocean and have no landmarks <coughs> to to look out the window to tell you where you're at i guess if uh <laughs> If I had to say I was ever scared, that might have been the, the time to, to say, yes, I was scared, I was worried. I've been asked that, but were you ever scared? I, I don't know that I was ever really, really scared that I wasn't going to make it back ahead faith that we were going to do. We were going to get back. Well, you had a few close calls. Uh, t you tell We're taken up to, uh, we're flown to Iwo, and we just turned around and headed back to, uh, to Saipan. We'd done our job. The next day, we took off on a bombing mission to Tokyo. The first night low-level incendiary mission and on that mission hour and a half into the flight we lost an engine salvaged our bombs and turned around went back t to Saipan were you uh ever having problems with the the jet stream? Was that why they were doing it low level? No, the low level was was for accuracy. Our original first missions were all done uh, at 28 to 30,000 and that they were briefed altitudes high level daylight the results sometimes were good sometimes not but you could get involved in the jet stream which at that altitude was was from your rear you could pick up a wind assist to the wing wind of a couple hundred miles an hour. We did we did do one mission from the southeast over Tokyo in which our ground speed was fifty seven miles or knots per hour. We use knots if you're in the Air Force. Only one mission. It was wasn't much better, but we got a new commanding general. 
and uh, he dropped us down to the to the fire raids, and we never did go back to the 28, 30,000 our high level dead. Uh, daylight missions were flown in the 15 to 17 or 18,000 foot. The uh, fire raids at night were done around 5,000 feet. Individual, no formation or anything. So the high level you were in formation, and what would a a typical formation, how many airplanes would that be the whole squadron or the bomb wing or? Well, you'd, you'd see each squadron, uh, so you'd have, uh, oh, nine, ten, maybe eleven. Mm -hmm. By that time, they, there was some additional planes getting out. So, um, the March 9th was the first incendiary nighttime attack on Tokyo, and then that you had to abort because of engine problems. Did you go, uh, go on the second mission? Yes, we were we were on the second mission then, which left in the evening of March the 11th. So you re you bombed at night, and on the return, first we lost one engine over Tokyo. Forty-five minutes later, we lost the second engine. As we headed home, fortunately, this became the second day that an emergency landing on Iwo Jima by a B-29 was allowed. Two days earlier, we'd have either had to ditch or bail out. Near, near Iwo, with a lot of assistance in the water, but certainly not as good as as landing. We we landed on Iwo in the morning of the 12th, and eight or nine hours later, they come from Saipan with a C-47 and picked up our crew. So on that day, the battle in Iwo Jima was still going on. The battle was where we parked our airplane at the north end of the runway. The Marines and the Japs were fighting about three miles north of that that runway. And did you know that when you landed? Yeah, we were told that. Of course, it was mm -hmm. a better a better spot than in the water. <laughs> Uh, so I assume you jumped out of the airplane, and then then what happened? Really, just walked away. Here's the Marines are walking around all over. Do you remember the uh, the scraps of food that we had? They told us, "Hang on to your own water, because you're not going to get any water here." And we had uh, we were carrying dry lunches at that time. Sandwiches, cake, and uh, Marines come walking by, kids, you know, 18 years old. Of course, we were old. We were 22, 23. And uh, any food? We give them our food. They thought they had a, had a birthday party with uh, food that we just threw in the box. We didn't, uh, I guess it was better than sea rations. They were probably getting sick of the sea rations and low on right. on food. Yeah. Well, let's back up uh, to earlier in that day. So uh, at, at night you, what was the initial point to turn to get to the Tokyo area? On the high level missions, uh, Most missions were Mount Fujiyama, which was northwest of, of Tokyo. We would fly in over that and turn it southeast into Tokyo. The, uh, the night mission was strictly a, a uh, compass heading, and we should all 
have been going in parallel. But uh, I've often wondered how many airplanes collided over Tokyo. The uh, on the mission of the 11th, the Japanese searchlights caught an airplane five, 500 feet higher than we were to our right, like at 2 o'clock, with the B-29, bomb bay doors open, bombs still in it, and they crossed over above us. They could have dropped the bombs and hit us if the timing had been wrong. But it certainly brought to mind how many times planes may have collided with one another in the dark. Yeah, if you weren't exactly parallel, the two planes could, could right. hit. That's right. When it was, uh, it's, uh, when you were going in, I assume you turned all the lights off and there weren't any lights on, right. the, on the plane, so it was dark. Could you make out another plane if it hadn't been lit up with a uh, search I plane? I don't, uh, I would say no, that you would be very lucky to have to be pretty close to see a silhouette. This one had been picked up with a search route, you know, from the ground, and, uh, they had him bracketed and he just flew out there just as clear as could be to us. But they never, uh, we were close but never got uh, touched by the searchlight. Were you uh, early in the, in, the, in the group that was going in so there was a lot of, of uh, fires already or were you uh, in there, did you come in later after a lot we of the city was probably oh. in the middle of it? Uh, the uh, plan they sent a little like a half a dozen what they called pathfinders. They hoped that they were they would go in and start some fires so that the rest, as the big group come in, there would be something to uh, to head for, you know, and mm -hmm. drop. Uh, what was it like to go through or fly through that airspace? That was uh, in the back. If you were in the second half of that, you had nothing but smoke to fly through, and that would could be picked up and brought into your airplane. You you knew you were flying through through the. Uh, smoke and fires and uh, because the, the Japanese housing, there was an awful lot of housing that was supposedly, you know, of wood and so forth, combustible material that once you got a good fire going, it, uh, it burned and I guess that is the uh, the story that come out afterwards? So you during a, a nighttime raid, were you over the target? Were you doing bombardier work or were you doing uh, gunnery work? No, you were doing bombardier work there. Mm -hmm. Each bombardier dropped there. It was in formation flying. Number one airplane on this. And number two, in the first triangle formation, the bombardiers sighted up and the rest of the airplanes dropped their bombs on, on visual as the first airplanes did. The, uh, then your bombardiers were on the guns. But uh, individual bombing, then your bombardier he used his sights and so forth. So in a formation, uh, did they drop us like a smoke bomb or you just watch for the bombs to come out of the bomb bay? No, your first, first two, really, two, two bombers were sighting with their mm -hmm. Norden sights. 
And when their air bombs come out, you dropped your bombs. In fact, actually, the bombardier didn't do it. The, the co-pilot did it with a long cord with a toggle switch on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would drop the bombs when he saw the uh, bombs come out of the first two airplanes in the first first uh, triangle. And on a low-level night mission, then, did they give you a specific target you were supposed to look for, or how, how did you know where when to drop the bomb? No, not the, maybe the first airplanes, yes, but, but uh, otherwise you, you just dropped on, on the city of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And you had enough light with all the prior fires, you knew where right. approximately yeah. the, the, the yeah. target would go. And I imagine you were pretty busy and concerned about getting shot at and the flak was going off and that sort of thing. Well, that's right, yeah. You were, you were concerned about, about flak and, uh, of course, there was no, uh, there were no fighters out. At that time, the fighters would drop you off away from the city before the, then the anti-aircraft would take day and night missions, it would be the same. Now you're talking about their fighters. Their, yes. So the their fighters would be at, after you, and then as you went into the city, right. the flak kind of took over and the fighter, their right. Japanese fighters right. were, took off yeah. and came back later. And at this point, uh, there weren't American fighters uh, in the Pacific yet? or. No, the fighters that uh, we had taken to Iwo Jima, it wasn't until um, April 12th, to my knowledge, that the first first mission that we had fighter con fighter uh, escort was April the 12th, and uh, the uh, four made this was the day mission. And as the bombers approached the islands of Japan, we made a circle and headed in. And as we looked overhead, there were the fighters doing the same. And uh, it was, to my knowledge, the first time that fighters from Iwo Jima had made had made that mission, and they did have a heyday. The Japanese did not uh, did not know or expect a fighter escort. I had one other mission where we had fighters scheduled, but they got lost, and it was only the one mission on April twelfth that I flew with fighter uh, escort. Now you had a mission where uh, there was an unusual thing where a seaplane actually came up to try and attack and you, you were involved with shooting it down, is that right? Right. They, uh, to my knowledge, the only Only kill that or it should be on my records was a a seaplane. We were up at 30,000, 34,000 feet at that time, and this was a single float under the fuselage, a couple of wing trip floats, single engine. He got up, he couldn't get any higher. It was just like a standing target out there, and I was I was credited with shooting down that that plane. I do have a newspaper article from Minneapolis that credits me with two shooting down two fighters on another date, but I don't know where that information come from. 
Well, it would be unusual to have a seaplane even get to that altitude. Were they holding, they must have had oxygen or something? Mm -hmm. Evidently, yes. He had, he had uh, yes. And an yeah. unpressurized uh, seaplane. Now, was that in front of the, your B-29? No, he come up, kind of come up from behind, uh, but, uh, or from the side, I guess, uh, Kevin. And, uh, that one I shot with the lower, the lower front turret, because that's the uh, turret that I had control of. The top turret would be cut off at that time, because you couldn't shoot that far down. Did a seaplane, uh, have you ever, did you ever see a, another thing like that, where a seaplane mm -hmm. came up and no. went after a formation of B-29s? No, I, that's the only one I ever saw. Um, when a fighter, a Japanese fighter attack, could they get up that high and, and uh, come at the formation of, of airplanes? Yeah, you'd have frontal attacks. They'd, you're, uh, you'd have to watch from, an, from front. Of course, they could close real fast between your speed and their speed. Uh, I recall one that come through. We had some people said it was a kamikaze. He was so close under our wing that I could see the pilot. He was fighting. To me, he was fighting to keep from hitting us as much as somebody else thought he was trying to hit us. Passed underneath and uh, so they did kamikaze attacks on other airplanes as well as the ships. Yeah, the uh, the flights that were made later into Okinawa and during that campaign, which would be about the time that I was had completed my missions, they had uh, kamikaze flights there amongst the airplanes as well as the ships. Um, on one occasion, did, were you involved with a, with an attempted rescue of a of another plane that had gone down? Yes, there was a. We would be sent out to join with the Navy. In this case, we were scheduled to go north of Saipan between Saipan and Iwo Jima. A plane had ditched, and they thought they had the coordinates, and there was a submarine, a U.S. submarine, coordinating a search with one airplane, ours, and their pattern was I'm going to say go north and east, uh, west and north, sorry, east and west, and then head north and turn, come back to the east, do a, uh, a pattern back and forth. We flew the opposite direction overhead and low searching from our airplane we had our crew and a couple others a couple other pair of eyes the uh, sub was on the deck the deck of the sub had a lot of sailors out conning tower was full and uh, our search did not find anything. The uh, story about this was at dusk, our pilot asked the uh, 
through the radio, subcommander permission to buzz them. Permission was granted and we backed off, gained some altitude and swooped down as it resulted too low. The co-pilot kept yelling, up, up. We almost almost hit the sub. We were so low. This was a sub on our side, right? This was the U.S. <laughs> sub. We were we were uh, searching for the for the B-29 that had gone down the day before. Of course, afterwards it was humorous. Couldn't quite figure out how it would look if the submarine fleet put a picture of a B-29 on their conning tower that they'd uh, sunk a 29 or shot down a 29. You figured uh, in a collision between a submarine and a B-29, probably the B-29 would lose. I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear anything from the submarine uh, no, people after we, that? Didn't, we didn't get any message. We, <laughs> we took off our own. Well, I guess the B-29 had uh, some stories about, because of the pressurized cabin, that you could ditch and the thing would float for a while um, because it, it didn't necessarily sink sink immediately. Um, did you ever see any B-29s that uh, had to ditch off a of Saipan or anything? Well, we saw it. Yes, I, I've seen some pictures. Uh, more stories than, than actually seeing them. There was a story about the B-29 that the crew bailed out at Iwo Jima. The plane was on automatic pilot and it flew 200 miles north, landed in the water, did not break up. The Navy had to go up and sink it. Uh, wasn't always that that good a landing, though. Mm -hmm. And the submarines uh, were pretty good at uh, picking up uh, the crews. I guess over 500 air crewmen were picked yes, up. Yes, there was. Uh, we were told that there was submarines, our U.S. submarines, in Tokyo Harbor. Now, the story. At the Eighth Air Force meeting, kind of brought that together. The, uh, yeah, they used the submarines well north. Yeah, I think uh, Herb Shower was a submariner, and he uh, uh, was on some of those submarines that picked yeah. up, did rescue work. Yeah, there's uh, there's quite a few guys that were rescued. Uh, Uh, you showed me your um, your log, which you kept. So you you kept a log, you know, not as a pilot, but as yeah. somebody keeping track of your missions that had 18 different things noted for each mission, and you had a number of uh, remarks for each of the um, uh, missions that you went on. Did you was this something you were supposed to keep or you just did on your own or No, it's something that I did on my own. And uh looking back now I don't know. Up to the first mission and after the last mission I still had a lot of service time and I didn't write anything down. I uh I did record from the first mission, November 27th, to the last one, May 17th. Well, I'll say, just uh, reading the remarks, it's fascinating, and you've got a lot of detail here of each one of the, th the missions, including the turn back. So there's probably mm -hmm. 35 different missions. I think uh, there's missions. 37 takeoffs there, I yeah. think. And then you noted um, the crews that were lost, so you were keeping track of... Uh, these people, which I assume you, you knew many right. of them. Yeah. And you had pretty heavy casualties in your squadron? I believe that our squadron 
of the 12 squadrons out there was the uh, suffered the most losses. Five of our original 20 crews come back. Now there were some crews where the, some of the personnel, they ditched, crashed or something, and some of them were saved. But only five of the original 20 in our squadron, the 873rd squadron, the 498th bomb group, and kind of information to back that up, I received from a friend a list of 43 airplanes assigned to the 873rd Squadron. The 874th Squadron during the time there only had 36 airplanes assigned and the 875th had 32 which would indicate that we we had more losses. We had more duplicates. Uh, the uh, there was one airplane that was, I think it was five times there was the airplane with the same number. I'm going to pause for just a moment for. Yeah. Uh, so the the markings on. Your squadron was the T square with a number, so it would be like T square one, two, three. That's right. Up through, would have been through 19, but they never did fill that out. The, uh, you know, through 20. And then the 874th was 21 through 40. The 875th would have been 41 through 60 for the assignments. And you, uh, looking at your, your log book, you flew a lot of different airplanes, so the t designation might be T square 5 on one mission, T square right. 6, uh, whatever, and th these were different airplanes, but also as a plane got shot down, then that T square 6 might be a n new or different airplane with could a different. It could be another airplane mm -hmm. with the. Uh, same number, yeah. Mm -hmm. So really the serial number tells you the specifics of the right. which airplane, but the designator gives you kind of a lead as to right. that. Well, there's uh, quite a few f um, films and photographs and so forth that the National Archives has of T-square designated airplanes on Saipan. Uh -huh. So would there be a good chance that you flew some of those? There'd be some overlap with uh, yeah. the film footage that the National Archives, although you wouldn't know exactly if the serial numbers matched uh, because of the fact that the designator was used over and over again. Yeah. Um, so were there replacement crews coming in uh, while you were uh, flying your missions? Yeah, there was a replacement crews in there. The, uh, I can't give you the number of crews we ended up. I know that probably we ended up more than uh, I don't know if we ever, I don't think we ever had more than 20 crews, but the uh, as we as we lost a crew or a partial crew, we'd uh, get, a, get a replacement. Did you have barracks, uh, like Quonset huts, or what did you live in? We were in Quonset huts. The, uh, <laughs> the officers were in Quonset huts, are enlisted
I think some of the uh, the flying personnel were in uh, in Quonsets too. The airplane commanders were all put into two Quonset ups where they where headquarters could find them all at one time, and then. Uh, My co-pilot, navigator, myself, and the engineer were all second lieutenants. We we were in uh, in a Quonset with about five other crews. I I don't recall exactly how many we had in the in the barracks. In some of the National Archives photos, it shows tents. Uh, were those for equipment or squad tents? I mean, uh, well, squad? yeah, large squad. canvas tents. I don't know what they were used for. Well, so some of them were for uh, for personnel, and maybe the large ones might have been for uh, uh, we had. Uh, I don't recall any tents up at the. What was it like living on Saipan? Did you get off the base or were you primarily on the base? Did you meet any of the people that uh, were lo locals? We, uh, as, a, as a result of being a Catholic and going to church, with the Catholic chaplain, there were two Catholic chaplains that covered the the uh, B-29 wing, and uh, myself and my engineer and one other fellow from Washington kind of chummed together, and Father Ty, who was from Kansas City. He actually lived in the quarters area of the service group attached to our two flying groups. And he uh, come one day and he says, why don't the three of you come over to our service group and after the movie Tell our, our fellas what you can about your flights. They see you take off and they see the planes come back in. They work on the on the roads, the runways and the planes and so forth. So as a result of that we went to the service group one night and gave a little talk and that night there was a Navy CB officer in the movie, in the movie crowd. No doubt wanted to see a special picture or something. And he come up to us afterwards and he said, why don't you, you guys come over to, to our uh, movie? which was on across the island, which four or five miles away, and give this kind of a talk to our group and have have supper with us. Yeah, okay, you know, kind of sloughed them off. Now the Navy Seabees are the engineers that build the airport and right. that sort of thing. The, uh, the group he was with was uh, about 240 men, just five officers, and uh, one that handled heavy equipment. That's the fellow that talked to us. And it was a carpenter. There was a guy that his trade was painter and so forth. He used to smile. The CEO was 
of the group was <laughs> hardware salesmen, the rest were uh, journeymen. And uh, we didn't think anything more of it. Three weeks later, we ran into the to the guy, and he said, "I thought you guys were coming over." Okay, we'll be there tonight. We get over there, and of course, it was it was a rough duty. Huh? Had to go to the Navy Club, have a few drinks, went back to the. CB unit, the dining room, dining room for five officers, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked, and there was a Navy enlisted man, a black, a black kid, white shirt, holding a napkin over his shoulder, over his arm. Sir, how would you like your steak tonight? <laughs> Well, needless to say, I think we were there pretty much every Thursday night afterwards. But we did get really acquainted with the uh, with the CBs, and they were good to us. Uh, we needed something over in our quantity. They built us uh, desks out of plywood and chests of drawers and little closets on each end. And, uh, well, they ate pretty well in the, in the Navy Seabees then. The Navy Seabees would get a boat and head out to sea. They they were able to find out when there were some ships that were heading back to the States from out in the west. And they'd go out and meet the ships and, and barter for, for food. We used to make the island commander, the admiral, that was in charge of the island mad because they beat <laughs> beat them up out there. So they eat real good, not uh, not necessarily all uh, you know uh, normal food. They eat better than that, and that little outfit, you know, they were. And uh, did you meet some of the, the nuns that uh, were original occupants before the Japanese had come in? Right. Through, uh, through the chaplain, Father Tai, we, uh, we met the Sisters of Mercy. They were Spanish nuns that were in the Marianas before the Japanese chased the, Jap the Spanish out. These were Spanish protectors before the first part of the war. And uh, the Japanese let the nuns be there. They uh, worked with the children mostly and the, and the natives. And they were, when the Japanese left, they were still there. And our Navy uh, offered to build them a new house, but it couldn't be inside of the stockade for the Navy, for the natives, and they wouldn't leave that. So they stayed in a in a concrete house. It was pretty nice. It wasn't just a shack. And then any flowing and running water or anything, the uh, Catholic chaplain got people to. They put up a tank and had them got running water, and you always see that they had extra food. But these uh, six nuns were over there in the stockade with the navy. The navy would, uh, or with the natives, the children were there. It was unlocked except at night. And then the natives, the uh, adults, they worked for the Navy, and, but they'd have to go back inside the lockup at night. So we had, uh, had the uh, six Catholic nuns that prayed a lot for, for all of us. <laughs> 
Well, the, and they had lived through the Japanese takeover of the island, the, the invasion by the American right. uh, Marines and Army, uh, and then uh, were there when you were there. They were there, yeah, yes. They, uh, in fact, uh, in May after I had, we had uh, flown our 30th mission, the nuns had, uh, were saying the rosary for all the flyers from the time the first airplane took off until the last one come back in. At least one nun was in their chapel. And after our 30th mission, there was about eight or nine of us, some from other crews, two other crews, and uh, we were over to see the nuns with the priest and Father Ty said, uh, he said, now you've prayed and you've got these, there were four of us that were there from my crew. And you've got these boys here, they're still flying, you've got to pray and get them off. And pray for me so you get home by, so I get home by Christmas. That would have been Christmas of 45. Well before anybody knew about an A-bomb or anything. And uh, remember he used the term deal. Now of the six nuns, two of them knew English to understand and to speak it. I would classify two of them as halfway down the line. They knew quite a few words. And then there'd be two that almost couldn't understand anything. And he used the deal. He said, I'll make a deal with you. And they couldn't understand deal. And they got around, okay, he got around to the world contracto, contract. They just understood that according to Spanish. And uh, one nun come out of the back. She didn't understand any. She couldn't talk any English. She's digging in her vestments. Comes out with a fountain pen. You know, sign it down. <laughs> Someplace there is a. Spanish American Cross Dictionary that has a written contract at, and adds history is told us we dropped the A bomb, the rest of them did get home. He got home, Father Ty got home by Christmas, and he promised them he'd get them a mother house in the United States. They had no no contact with the United States. And uh, two of the nuns got to the United States in 1946. The mother superior had gotten sick and the Navy sent her to Hawaii and after treatment, the two nuns get on an airplane for Minneapolis, for Minnesota, for the United States. That's what I should say. They had no visas, no passports, no nothing. They got as far as Chicago. They were heading for Cincinnati because they'd been corresponding with some nuns in Cincinnati because of Father Ty. And they got picked up by immigration. Well, they got that straightened out. and They ended up in Kansas City and the bishop didn't buy uh, Father Ty's promise that he'd get him a mother house. But before they went back to the Saipan, he had granted them a uh, a hospital building that was not being used 
to be used as a rest home. And in the fall of 1946, the first Spanish Sisters of Mercy were on the way from Spain to Kansas City. To my knowledge, they're still there. Some of the order, because my daughter-in-law's grandmother spent six years with the with the Spanish nuns of mercy in this rest home. This was after my grandson got married. And uh, and you have relatives today in Kansas uh, City. You got relatives, grandson and granddaughter-in-law in Wichita. Her oh. parents are in Kansas mm -hmm. City. Well, before we get that far, let's go back. So uh, your last mission was in May, and then in June uh, you received some uh, medals. Is that right? June the 7th was the presentation of this Distinguished Flying Cross to the group. And uh, we had, not necessarily that day, we did get a, a boost in rank. You couldn't go home without... Uh, getting an up to first lieutenant and on the 10th of June my engineer and I and some of our other crew were able to get on a troop transport they went to Hawaii and that was the start of our trip home. So, in addition to the Distinguished Flying Cross, don't you also have an uh, air medal with uh, some clusters? I had three, yeah, the air medal with three clusters. And I guess there's a, there are a couple of other ones, you know, territorial ones, but those were the awards. And I understand there's a photograph of your, uh, your crew during the presentation? Right. Mm -hmm. um, on the, the, the ride home on the troop transport, did you run into a group that had been fighting in uh, China? Right. The, uh, well, they were well, well publicized. The Merrill's Marauders, which fought in the jungles, and uh, they were on the on the troop, troop, troop ship coming back. We had some experiences talking to them. Talked to a medic that was with them. And they got talking about putting the Japanese sun up on, on something uh, like we put on our airplanes. And they laughed at him about his, his folding gurney that they carried with him. How many uh, rising suns did he have stuck on that? The uh, story was that uh, they would cap capture a Japanese soldier, or he'd be in a fight, and they had no place to, uh, they had a prisoner, and no place to lock him up. To release them, to return them, and uh, as much as said that sometimes the medic might take care of them, they didn't have any problems with them. After uh, never, never had any contact with them after we got to, to Hawaii. Did you have any time off when you got to Hawaii or the, the States? As it ended in Hawaii, I had, we had 11 days of of uh, R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. We were looking for a way home and one of the planes from our own group was headed back to the States. It was flyable, but not war-worthy. They couldn't pressurize it or anything. 
And as a result, we signed on with him, and there were 19 of us on the plane on takeoff, and uh, lost an engine on takeoff, and had to go back and land and get an engine replaced. So we spent another five days there, and then took off for San Francisco and reached San Francisco on July 3rd of 1945. I have a telegram. I sent my mother, send my clothes to the drag cleaners and be home. And then uh, did you uh, go home immediately or did you have uh, leave or what? what how well, did you? We had, a, we had a train ride from there. We spent about four days in uh, at Marchfield and uh, we were put on a train back to Minneapolis. And then we had to leave. We had to report to, to uh, Fort Snelling. And we had 30 days leave. So during that leave, was that when the atomic bomb, I think that was August of uh, August 45? August yes. Uh, so where were you when you heard about this? Well, I was here because my engineer and I, we had, uh, we were knew we were heading back to California. And uh, we applied for an extension to our leave. Asked for 10 days. I got 10 days granted and Bob was turned down. Now we were going to take, I had a car here and we were going to drive to California. And I told him, well, I said reapply for seven days and give a different, different reason. Well, he got seven days, so. But it was in the time that we were here that the A-bomb was dropped. Now the A-bomb was off the island of Tinian, six miles away from the side of the island of Saipan that we lived on. And other than we knew there was a special air group over there called the 509th Composite. We had no clue of anything like a A-bomb or an end to the war. So at six miles, you was probably within visual distance from Saipan, but you had no idea of had no idea the, that this, so they had pretty good security. Yeah. Well, we had two uh, two bomb groups on, on Tinian too, with the, uh, the 58th wing and the 313th, but uh, uh, as far as, <laughs> I've never heard of anybody uh, knowing anything about it. Mm -hmm. So once uh, once the bomb was dropped, it was fairly shortly thereafter that the war ended. Um, did you get discharged? Or where were you discharged? Well, we had the orders to uh, Santa Ana, California, and uh, back in February of 45 on Saipan, they asked us if we wanted to stay in the service or not, and you, know, you only had a few missions under your belt, you told them no, at least uh, I told them no, my engineer told them no. When we got to California, we tried to change our mind, but it was too late. They said uh, their plans were were cut just so many people. So as a result, we had orders after about uh, five weeks in, in Santa Ana back to back to uh, Fort Snelling. And that was your track. separation center then, right. was Fort Snelling? Then you were out. You were, what did you do after the war? I went back to uh, 
back to the trucking business. In fact, uh, first week I had the truck line that I worked for sent me to Whitehall, Wisconsin because it was deer hunting season and the guy running the little the terminal down there wanted to go deer hunting. So that was my first week back. Well then I'm back here to Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, worked part around here and then was sent one week to Eau Claire and one week to Winona and two weeks basically a month in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. When you were uh, on your last, uh, maybe this doesn't apply, but at some point did you get something that they called a ruptured duck, which was you were supposed to sew it on your uniform after discharge, or were you so close to home you didn't need to do that? That was a, the discharge, you know. I probably have one. Do you still have your what? uniform? Yeah, it's upstairs. Mm -hmm. My my dress uniform. Uh, my wife, my wife had uh, had hers had the pin uh, on her uh, her ruptured tuck. I think she used to put the damn thing on the on the collar. Yeah, her. Uh, just talking about that. Her uniform's upstairs yet too. June 7th of 47. Mm -hmm. And you have several children? I have four children. Uh, the oldest, Paul, was born in Winona. And uh, we lived a year in Winona and then two years in Milwaukee. Moved back here in July of 1950. The other three children were born here. So your career basically was in the trucking industry, uh, in doing the dispatch right. part of it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when did you retire from work? Retired on my birthday, February 25th, 1983, mm -hmm. in 62. <laughs> well, I, is there any other uh, Topics that maybe I didn't cover uh, that you think no, would be important. Pretty to, well covered, did my net. Uh, well, probably remember things after we're oh. we're done. But um, I want to uh, thank you very much. This has been an excellent uh, interview, and uh, I'm going to end our video equipment now.